Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Baku Show. I'm your host, Baku Ambianda. Today, today's guest is a dynamic individual who has achieved greatness in the aviation industry. Captain Solomon Queno is a Ghanaian airline captain working with MC Dan Aviation, a private jet charter company in Ghana. He previously worked with Emirates Airline based in Dubai and flew the world's biggest passenger airplane, the Airbus A380, A380, and the first person to captain the A380 flight to the Kotoka International Airport. Prior to Emirates, he was with British Airways and he was awarded in 2019 the 3G Aviation Man of the Year and was named the 2019 Aviation Man of the Year in West Africa by Balafon Aviation Awards and won the African Travel 100 person at the African Diaspora Tourism Conference. Captain, it's been a pun pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege having you on the Baku Show today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I mean, you recently wrote, launched a, a book, yes. Flutter Until You Fly. Yes. I read the book and it was very, very inspirational. And my first question that I just need to ask you is, what inspired you to write that book? Okay, so um, I uh, entered aviation. It's been my childhood passion to become a pilot. And all along, I have I thought that um, it was just me uh, yearning to become a pilot and I mean, fly planes, travel everywhere. And but uh, in 2018, when I was selected to captain the 380 to Ghana, which I did, it sort of lifted the whole nation of Ghana and Africa actually. And uh, a lot of kids started looking up to me, asking questions. We always wanted to be pilots. We wanted to be this. We thought it was beyond us. How did you do it? So with all the questions and all the kids coming up to me, I started in, uh, mentoring them and trying to inspire them. And uh, I realized that telling each person, trying to inspire each person mm. in a certain wouldn't help. So I thought, why don't you put your story together and share with the world? If I share with the kids, it will inspire them. And in inspiring them, I can also use the process from the book to empower them. It's not enough to just inspire people, but when you inspire them, at least you give them hope and you give them the means to get to where they want to uh, be. So my main reason two main reasons for writing the book is one, to inspire yeah. the youth and then to empower them. And I, and I noticed that your upgrowing was not easy. You, you worked as a cleaner, you worked at the brain, you've, you've done so many odd jobs. And just tell us how, how difficult was it like to leave for that tough growing up to becoming um, uh, a great and, and uh, remarkable pilot. Um, it, it was, uh, to say that it was difficult is an understatement uh, because, uh, yeah, looking at my uh, life story, having nowhere to stay uh, from a uh, very young and tender age and uh, begging people to have a uh, roof over our head and uh, cramping into our room, cramping into our room, which I mean, when it rains, we know how the rain is in Africa. When it rains, some of the leaks in the room creates uh, what we call swimming pool or muddle. And it was very difficult. And to have uh, that vision to persevere, even by some of my family members doubted uh, me and told me, uh, stay in your lane. You know, forget about this uh, dream of becoming a pilot. People laughed at me, but and so it was very difficult in terms of finances, in terms of the path, in terms of uh, guidance. It was very difficult, but um, I persevered. Yeah, and, and there's a saying that when you tell people your dream and they don't laugh at you, 
it means your dreams are too small. But at some point, because you mentioned that people laughed at you, your friends laughed at you, yeah. and at some point, did you doubt it yourself? Um, I didn't doubt myself, but yeah, I looked at myself. I looked at the means and the, the where I was and where I was aiming to get to. I didn't know how to go about it. It was so difficult. I didn't have any doubt about myself at all. I was just frustrated and asking myself how, how, all the time. And uh, because of that, I, if you read in the book, some uh, of my grades didn't go as well as they were meant to go because I was always thinking, asking things. And it was a blessing in disguise with my grades because maybe if I had achieved the required grades at certain times, yeah. I would have probably gone the wrong, a different direction. You, 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 you got... Uh, you, you you got refused entering into the, the Air Force at the beginning. Yes, I wasn't refused. I passed all the assessment, but I didn't make the initial grade requirement. I passed all the Air Force assessment, but they were requiring certain minimum grades from my A-level, and I didn't achieve that. So <laughs> it sort of disqualified me from getting into the Air Force. One, one fascinating thing, when I was talking about Oh, I have to have an interview with you. Yesterday, just in the evening, I was watching the documentary of Cristiano Ronaldo on Netflix. And at some point, the mother mentioned that she wanted to abort Cristiano Ronaldo. But the pastor said, this boy is going to become a great person today. And Cristiano Ronaldo is one of the best players they will have seen. And you had a similar thing in your, in, in your book. You yeah. mentioned about uh, your mother wanting to abort you. Yeah. How did that make you feel as a child, knowing that your mom told you that she wanted to abort you? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, life, as I said earlier, was very difficult uh, with a lot of hardships, lack of money, nowhere to live. And uh, we had some relatives living with us as well. So uh, my mom thought wisely that no, she's got five kids. There is no need to add another one uh, to the to the kids because uh, life was tough mm -hmm. for her. So I understand her reasoning, but uh, one day I think my dad was very fast for her, <laughs> and but uh, she got pregnant, mm -hmm. and then uh, so. She, as you rightly said, she decided to abort me and then she was advised not to. She uh, thankfully disgusted with a, a pastor and the pastor advised her not to. Back to the question, how did I feel when she told me? I felt usually people who feel that, oh, I'm unwanted, but I felt very happy that I'm a unique person, you know, that though my mom didn't plan or wanted me, I know that I'm a special person. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here. She would have aborted me, but because God has something special for me, that is why uh, I came here. So I didn't blame my mom. I uh, understood where she was coming from, but after she told me the story, mm -hmm. it made me feel that I am special and God has something special for me to achieve. Oh, on this, oh, and, and along the journey, along the journey, what was, when did you feel like you had that magic moment in your life where the future seems to be unknown? Like you felt like the future is dark. Well, well, when was that magic moment for you? Well, after, uh, uh, mainly after uh, my uh, university in Ghana, uh, University of Ghana, I went to the UK and I was doing all sorts of menial jobs, uh, construction labor, labor cleaning, uh, pizza delivery guy. Uh, my friends I was at the university with were working as uh, engineers, geologists, medical doctors, and here I was uh, being a cleaner and a laborer. And in the winter, during my break, I would go and sit at Hyde Park. We were refurbishing some hotels around the Hyde Park in uh, so I'll go and sit at Hyde Park and without any jacket, it would be snowing and I'll just be sitting and crying and then asking myself, when, how is it going to happen? Mm -hmm. So I think those periods were very dark moments for me uh, uh, because 
I thought my friends were way ahead and that he didn't know my left from my right where I was, where I was standing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was very uh, difficult at the time. I, 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 well, you're talking about your time in UK. I, I, I know you, you, you went through a moment where you felt like everything was moving right. You got um, uh, the approval to, to be trained at British Airway and just of a sudden the 9-11 happened and everything was just coming to an end. How did you overcome that challenge? And just tell us how the whole moment, how did you felt like things were moving and all of a sudden all these disaster happened and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a, it was a bit of a deja vu, <laughs> you know. Most of the time, I go so close yeah. and then something blocks it. I go so close and, I, and the Air Force is a typical example that I got so close, did, I was one of the best in the assessment at the Air Force, but my grace prevented me. And then here was me at British Airways. Now I have the moment and I have the opportunity to be trained and paid for by British Airways. And then something happens that destroys it. And I asked myself, why? Why me? Why me? And then I sat down and I thought, no, this is the moment. I'm not giving up. I am going to that training. Uh, and so the same cause British Airways was going to take us on, uh, I decided I was going to go to that and, 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 and do that cause. I didn't have the money. I didn't know where the money was coming from, but I said, no, now is the time. Uh, I'm going for the cause. So I started researching, looking for options, and then found possibilities of loans, mm -hmm. and then applied. They said, you'll give me the loan when the time came. <laughs> so many issues. I, I read about a friend that kept telling you that he'll give you a loan, and will, you will not pick up the call when you call. But yeah. one thing that stood out for me was the friend that opted to give his property yeah. for loan. Yes. So tell us about that. Like, how, uh, like, do you think in the world that we live today where people are very self-centered? Yeah. Like, how like how impactful was that person in your life at that time? Yeah, it's, it's not even just one person. It's two friends. Because initially, the one with his wife who opted to use their uh, property as a collateral, um, I gave it to, I went to, show it to the bank manager and he said no it's not enough so mm -hmm. another person has to add his property as a collateral coming back to the question yes these days it's very difficult to uh, mm -hmm. find selfless people so, who will help you in this situation i can't blame some of these people because uh people try to take advantage. You can't trust people. And what I tell the youth these days is that if these two friends didn't trust me, they wouldn't have given their property as a collateral. So what we are doing now, how we relate to our friends, any person we come into contact with, we have to be truthful. We have to be, uh, uh, we have to relate to them in an honest and truthful way because we don't know who will be our helper mm -hmm. uh, in our journey. But if we are truthful and honest, it gets to a point they will sacrifice themselves for you. And if they cannot trust you, they wouldn't do that. So you are trying to say you it, it is based on how you portray yourself, how you carry yourself, yeah. how truthful and honest you they, that made your friends to feel like they can go all out for you okay. that's correct and 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 do you think that was part of like your up, up growing because i i noticed at some point when you were growing up in your book you mentioned how uh, you would dress like a pilot and 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 you will you will feel like you are in a, you are, you are flying a plane how how important is believing in your dream for you like how important do do someone have to believe in their dream um was when you have a dream, uh, there will be a lot of stumbling blocks. Uh, you will hit uh, dead ends and then a lot of disappointments. If you don't believe in the dream, you will easily give up and turn to another thing because there are various options 
you know, when I was growing up, I could have become an architect, I could have done this, I could have done that. And there were times I was making reasonable money, mm. you know, and uh, but I said no. You know, though, uh, when I was in the, an engineer, for example, with British Airways, people would die to do that job, you know, and uh, out of maybe 100 people who apply for that job, maybe five would be uh, successful. But here I was working with the best airline in the UK and one of the best in the world as a design engineer, taking decision making a lot of uh uh involved in a lot of projects in projects, you know, amazing, amazing high technology projects. And anybody would die to be there. But if you don't believe in your dream, you will get there and you think this is why there is no need to continue. But believing in your dream will make you stay focused all the time. Yes. But there might be other distractions, seemingly good things, but it will help you to stay focused uh, to the dream. Did you ever feel like giving up? Um, I, at some point, yes, you look at it and you look at the, uh, uh, the challenges and the means, you feel like, why don't you even forget it? And for, for some strange reason, every time it will come back to me. Yeah. It will come back to me. So I had no choice but to uh, persevere. If, let's say if you had to live your life all over again, what would you have done differently? Um, I, I don't know what I would do differently, but probably um, plan a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky. I met some great angels mm -hmm. um, who helped me in so many ways. And... Uh, the book I wrote, I'll come back to the question, is, as I was saying, was is to inspire the youth and to empower them. However, with the uh, writing of the book, it's also for these kind of angels, you know, who have the means to help me empower the youth. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be involved with the foundation to buy the book, put them in their schools because every little kid, I believe, deserves to do it. Mm -hmm. It I gain some to my uh, security guys, the cleaners, and it's changing their life. They are changing and they are realizing they can do it. You know, so growing up, what would I have done differently? Well, probably I've found myself maybe some great mentors mm -hmm. like now I'm trying to be that and be the, um, the and cattle for the youth who do not know where to turn. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would have done was to probably find myself a great mentor, learn from them, and help me along the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the path I went through, of course, I would have preferred a smoother path and uh, an easier path, but. I I I don't think I had the choice to change that direction, and and, and you had to make some very tough decisions along the way. And that, are we're we gonna get to that point of that inspirational aspect of your foundation. Yeah. But tell us about that transition from British Airways to Emirates, because reading the book, I, I felt like there is a lot that young people need to learn yeah. from you. Because uh, the, the generation we live today, so many people have great ideas, yeah. dreams, but they give up along the That's way. Right, yeah. And sometimes they settle. Yeah. They, they feel like, oh, yeah. I've made it. Like, and, and, and then they realize that, oh, where they are after a period of time, they have settled and they don't have a way to continue. But I, I, I could see you moving from this to this and moving from British Airway to Emirates and having that dream that you are going to be a, a captain uh, with the biggest passenger plane and finally you made it. How was it for you? Yes, um, uh, we touched on believing and I always, uh, through the difficulties, I was always imagining myself, picturing myself doing what I want to do. So, for example, when I was a 
chauffeur or mini cab driver mm -hmm. driving to Heathrow and back, I will see the British Airways airplanes on approach. Mm -hmm. And I'll picture myself to be the pilot in the plane, flying that plane. And a lot of the planes I used to picture myself in when I joined British Airways was the first airplane I flew for British Airways. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes when we dream, we see the dream as this and that's it. But then I ask myself, what next? What next? All the time. So I was in British Airways. No one leaves British Airways. I was a design engineer. Everybody will kill to be there. I stopped, went for flying. I stayed focused. Finished the flying, worked with BMI. I thought, this is not the airline I want. I want British Airways, went to British Airways. And then nobody leaves British Airways as a pilot. And then I had to make that decision to leave for Emirates. And then when I went to Emirates, saw myself, when we did the tour, I went to sit in the 380, the captain seat, and I said, I said to myself, Close my eyes and I said, I'm a captain of the 380. I'm a captain of the 380. Wow. So I always picture what I want to be in my head and I play it over and over and over until it becomes a reality. So what uh, pushes me to do that is I ask myself, what next? What next? Because I don't believe in... Uh, in that I have arrived because the dream of becoming a pilot, as I said earlier, is supposed to lead to other things. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself, what is that? And that is why I keep pushing forward. And I keep. Pushing. I will you say it, it is preparation that met opportunity, or of because I know I noticed at some point in your book that you had to ask yourself that all the self education yeah. you've had to to take, you can't leave it. So you had to keep striving. So so how important is that? Of course, preparation is uh, very, very important. You know, and uh, people uh, sometimes say that, uh, oh, you were lucky. Mm -hmm. You were lucky. And someone told me the acronym for luck uh, sometimes. So let's say you mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo. He's very talented. But what stands him out from the others is that after training, he's, he goes back and practice and practice and practice and practice. And all these great people, they go beyond what uh, the ordinary person you do. Mm -hmm. And someone also said that uh, the successful and unsuccessful, they have one thing in common. They don't want to wake up very early in the morning and read or do whatever. They don't want to stay at night and do Things. They don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But the difference between the successful and unsuccessful is that the successful people will do it anyway. They don't want to do it, but they'll wake up and do it because they want to be successful. So coming back to that luck, they said, you labor under the correct knowledge. So L is labor that is working. Mm -hmm. You under uh, C, correct knowledge. If I have the correct knowledge, I will always be lucky. If Christian Ronaldo knows that if I bend it this way and practice and practice and he's got the knowledge, so he will always be lucky scoring the goals. And you are very right when you mentioned that because one thing that I actually really learned yeah. from your book was, wow, Captain was a very resourceful person. I, I noticed you, or you, you mentioned about finding a scholarship that was fulfilled, finding this program. And I think the, 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 the generation of today are not going out for those resources that can help them from point A to point B. What do you have to say about that? Um, I, I, the current generation, unfortunately, because they have everything instant at their fingertips, uh, do not want to research. Sometimes I mentor people and uh, they will ask me a certain question. And I said, in my days, we didn't have Google. <laughs> we didn't have AI. So all you have to do is to just Google mm -hmm. and read yourself. Some of these things you don't have to effort for themselves. Uh, they have to make the effort, do the work, because I've mentioned them, but they don't expect me to do the work for them. Well, well, you yeah. have to do the work for themselves. I'll guide them, yeah. but they have to do the work for themselves. 
there is uh, one great uh, personality I follow a lot, Les Brown. He, he always mentioned that when someone tells you that you cannot do something, it takes about 100 people to tell you, you can, you can, you can, to neutralize that time that one person have told you that you cannot do something. Did you have people along your journey who told you you can't be a pilot? Oh, yeah. Yes, so many, so many, so many of them. I mean, from the first time I said I'll be a pilot, all my friends laughed at me, apart from one. Uh, there were times we were in church and uh, we were uh, going through some courses and one guy laughed at me. This guy said he wanted to build a bank. But when I said I wanted to be a pilot, he told me your dream is too big. So what? how is becoming a pilot bigger than building a bank? And he believed in his dream, but he didn't believe in my dream. And there were a lot of people who told me I couldn't make it, but there were equally good people who told me you are very intelligent, you are smart, you can do it. And the most important thing is I believed in myself. Regardless what people said about me, uh, I believed in myself. There were, when I was in secondary school, uh, maybe the way I was very nice and always uh, uh, relating very well and laughing with people, some of my seniors will look at me and tell me that this guy is such a foolish boy. He doesn't know anything. You know, and this, that, that. But I didn't allow these things to dampen my spirit or limit me. So how did you face situations? Like, I noticed when the 9-11 happened, your wife told you that, look, people are having accidents and you are trying to go and be a pilot. How, how did you have to stay strong and firm yeah. and focus with, with all those things happening? Yeah, I think uh, probably, uh, one, my belief uh, uh, that this is what I have to do. And two, because I've done aerospace engineering, I know what goes into airplane designs. I had read a lot on accident investigation, airplane accident investigations, and things like that as well. So I have, I had the knowledge that even when my sister was watching it live, when the second plane uh, hit the tower, and my sister told me, look, why do you want to be a pilot? And I said, this is not a problem with the plane. I think there is something definitely wrong because the plane cannot just go and hit a, a, a building, but there is something going on. We didn't have the full picture. So my background knowledge also helped me and my belief helped me that uh, I know about aeroplanes. They don't crash the all plane. the time. You know, and they did a, a survey in the UK and they said that even the number of people who die on UK roads alone is like one big aircraft crashing every day. And we don't have a big aircraft crashing every day. And I knew that aviation is the safest form of transportation. So I knew that uh, that is uh, not what that is not the usual aviation, but yeah. what was your what was your worst day as a pilot? <laughs> <laughs> my worst day as a pilot, yeah. Uh, when I probably joined my first uh, company, um, uh, yeah, there were some people who didn't like me, and they were doing those sort of things. And I think those times were some of the uh, worst and uh, and uh, 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 worst times as a pilot today i don't know what their problem was they just wanted to get rid of me from my company and we're spreading bad rumors but i i, I let my talent show and uh, they were told of uh by the chief pilot and then the management of the company and i'm sure as a as a pilot so many people would like to know uh particularly some of us that we travel also a lot have you had the situation where you're on the air and having all the turbulence and you had to feel like, oh, this is, this is, this is it, this is the end? <laughs> I've had a lot of, I mean, one of the worst turbulence from New York to Dubai. It was really, really bad. But as I said, if you have the knowledge, mm -hmm. know the capabilities. And I know turbulence will not bring the plane down. Okay. It just feels uncomfortable. As far as you are safe and you've secured yourself, You'll be fine. Uh, the turbulence will not bring the plane down. So I've never, though I've gone through many turbulence. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm never afraid that I'll, it will kill me. No. <laughs> I do. That, that's, so let's let's talk about your foundation. What, what is what is the mission and the and the vision for the foundation? Okay. And with the foundation, 
as I uh, mentioned earlier, I found myself struggling to become what I wanted to be. Uh, finding the financial means, finding the guidance and uh, mentors to help me, direct me and guide me to where I wanted to be. So I set up the foundation just for that, to help people, not necessarily only those who want to be pilots, but mm -hmm. those who want to, they have a dream. They want to get to the dream and we mentor them, we guide them and if required, we do what we can financially mm -hmm. to support them. So currently we pay fees for a lot of people, school fees, talented guys. This is really, sometimes we get the uh, schools to select the people mm -hmm. and pay for their fees. Uh, there is a school in the Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian Women College of Education. We pay fees for students, uh, maybe 10 to 20 students a year. And we will increase that uh, per sec. We have we have a a, a program where they guide um, talented guys to get admission to some of the Ivy League schools in the U.S. And I'm out of it. We guide them. We pay money for their uh, registration fees and all that. And we guide them on their SAT preparation. Mm -hmm. We give them the materials, and then we teach them how to fill the application. And then they write a sub doing well, and most of them get full, all of them get full scholarship mm -hmm. to Ivy League schools in the US and other countries. And there are others, also very good, who do not get admission to the Ivy League schools, but can't even afford the form to apply for the universities. Okay. There was one guy who got eight A's uh -huh. and didn't have the money to even travel to uh, the universities for interviews, medical students. So I mean, we pay for these people, we pay for the accommodation, we pay for their fees, and they get admission so they can go and become all they they want to be because mm -hmm. they've got the talent. It's just money that invests them, you know, uh, transportation, maybe to adversities, mm -hmm. and they can't afford it. And there are so many people like that. One of my uh, friends, uh, he's got a, a property in Kumasi, back to Kenya University, and we work on it. We uh, renovate it, and uh, we give it out free mm -hmm. to about fifty students uh, who stayed there for free while they are in, in the university. So these are the things mm -hmm. the foundation is doing. Uh, so we guide these people, mentor them. I mentor the aerospace group at present, and we are trying to set it up at Kukulia as a tech and dangerous schools. Mm -hmm. There is a school in Kumasi, a Fia public school, uh, young girls who are building uh, drones and planes and mm -hmm. homes like that. We built a railway for them. We help build a railway for them by contributing financially, and we help them with the uh, programs, building the services, mm -hmm. like, things like that. Mm -hmm. So the foundation is to inspire our youth and empower mm -hmm. them. And uh, we don't have any limit. Anything we can do to educate the people and get them to where uh, they have to be, we will do our best. And, and how do people, uh, how can people get in contact with the foundation? Is there a website? Or... Uh, we have the website, it's down, but we are going to try and uh, bring it up okay. again. Mm -hmm. Currently, I've done everything uh, by my own mm -hmm. means, um, from my own pocket and uh, with the book. But we want to uh, get about the website mm -hmm. and then put a lot of the things we've done on and help people uh, to contribute and help them. Oh, the, the angels I talked about mm -hmm. to contribute, to buy the books, put it in the schools, uh, get the kids to read it be inspired and then mm -hmm. you show them what is possible as well. We will get the website back up and running because uh, we set up the website just before 2020 and because of the COVID, okay. yeah, things slowed down a bit. Yeah. So, so currently, where can people find your book if they need the copies of your book? If, if they uh, Google the title, Flat On To You Fly, they will have a lot of options to buy. Uh, they have the e-book, they have the PDF on the end. 
We have audio book. I think the audio book is out now. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can order from Amazon. And various uh, online um, uh, 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 online sites mm-hmm. where they can get the book. Also, if people are in Ghana and they cannot find uh, the book, I have numbers here they can call mm-hmm. and then it will guide them on. Uh, how to uh, get the book. Please, can we have some of the number? Okay. And, and also, they can get on my Instagram, Instagram. Mm-hmm. Instagram account, which is the Captain uh, underscore, Captain Queen underscore 380. Do you do, do, you do speaking engagements? Yes, yeah. uh, I do uh, speaking engagements. Uh, I go to the KNUS team. Sometimes the aerospace guys, they call me, mm-hmm. and I go and speak in the UK. I do a lot in the UK. Yeah. Uh, for uh, fantasy wings uh, to inspire young people and various schools with Reuters. We do a lot of work with Reuters as well. I, I was going to ask you, your story is very inspirational. What is next for you? Are you thinking to have flat down to fly one day, become a movie? Yes, it's uh, one of the things I have talked about. And a lot of people who have read it have told me that it has to be a movie. Yeah, yes. Yes. So it's one of the uh, things we are exploring mm-hmm. and I'll discuss it with the publishers because I've come across a few people they tell me we'll do this, we'll do that, but mm-hmm. they don't show up. But uh, I'm sure definitely we will find a way to make it into a movie. Right now, at this point in time in your life, what gives your life a sense of fulfillment? Um, I, I, I don't know if I find myself fulfilled. Yet, I feel there is a lot I can do yeah. to help the youth and the and the those coming up. I drive around and sometimes I see the kids begging on the street, and I weep inside. You know, so I feel that if I can help get these people off the street and get them to where they want to be, then I think I'll be fulfilled. I'm happy I achieved my aim as a pilot. Uh, we are currently running a private charter business mm-hmm. in Ghana, uh, private jets. We are getting some helicopters and things like that. And uh, so that is what I'm managing now. I fly, I still fly anyway. But in terms of fulfillment, if I can help the youth get to where they want to be, if I can help set up all these aviation schools in Ghana, uh, to help train our people here in Ghana, I think uh, probably that will help me. <laughs> you were that you were a, a a young person who thought about becoming one of the best pilots in Ghana, flying the biggest passenger air, air, airplane, and becoming a pilot from a neighborhood that you didn't find a lot of people with that similar dreams. You made it possible. I believe that a lot of young people. With, uh, with bigger dreams, with big dreams in their own, but they are, they are sitting somewhere and telling themselves they can. What is that one message you can tell them? It's possible. They can. They have to believe and they can. And what guys, regardless of their situation, their resources, they can do it. When times get hard for you, what gets you going? When times get hard, I just pray. I pray and I look at the past mm-hmm. and I say, if I've been able to move from that past to here, I can get to where I'm going to. And what is your favorite quote? <laughs> In the military, they don't wait for war to prepare. Yeah. Be prepared before the war. Because if you don't prepare before the war, when you go to war, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> so they are always prepared for you. In the military, when there is no war, they are always preparing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They strategize, they do this, they do that, always getting ready. So as soon as the war comes, they are ready. As you said, uh, opportunity meets preparation. Captain, it's been a very pleasing pleasure having this conversation with you. Your book is so inspirational. Your journey is so inspirational. I believe so many young people need to pick a copy of your book and just read to understand that everything is possible. And I just wanted to thank you for being part of people's life and uh, being that Ghanaian who had that uh, 
that that preparation I made opportunity because lastly there was a, a point in your book that I said, hmm, what God has made for someone, no one can stop it. You had a British passport, you were in Emirates, they appointed you, they selected you to be the first person to fly the biggest passenger airplane to to open up the Kotoka International Airport. You thought it was because you were Ghanaian. They didn't, they didn't know that. They didn't know that. Like, how did that make you feel? I felt very uh, happy, you know, very happy, very proud uh, to be a Ghanaian. And also, I thank God for giving me the opportunity to be uh, that inspiration to the youth. And I thought uh, when they told me about it and all the interviews and camera pre preparation for the flight, I thought uh, that, uh, thank God, uh, now I understand why I had to become a pilot. <laughs> and as we get to the conclusion, how did you come about with the title Float Down to You Fly? Um, yes, I thought about my life, uh, how difficult it was. And yes, you try to fly and you fall down, you try to move, you fall down here and there, but it didn't stop me. So we thought that, okay, yes, keep trying until you get there. During the launch of this book, you had so many dignitaries that were present and how you making a presentation in front of so many people that have been along your journey, so many people that have worked with you and so many people that you looked up to. How was it? How did you feel? You know? I felt very proud and very happy that this is the young person who nobody knew. People laughed at me, but thankfully, because of the talent and the hard work, uh, I had all these dignitaries come and support me. And uh, um, I, I, I couldn't have asked for more, you know, um, because usually nobody would look at me when I was growing up and I was a kid. But now they came to support because they know as the, the favorite quote, one of the quotes saying that your know, talent will take me to curses, yes. yeah, to the uh, to the kings, and I thank God that I was able to persevere, hold on, keep going, so that it will bring me closer to all these dignitaries. They say when a man washes his hands, yeah. he's a dying with yeah. What is your last message to the young people? My last message to the young people is that it is possible. Uh, look at my life, it is possible because my book is to show you what is possible. And I want you to get the book, read it, be inspired, and believe in yourself that you can get there regardless of the challenges and the mountains you can climb. Thank you very much, Captain. Thank you so much.